All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Pfeiffer. I am the host of Conversations on Retail. We are uh, with Doug Geyer today, one of the co-founders of Brandshare, and I've uh, really been looking forward to this conversation. Doug, thank you so much for making the time to visit. You bet. Honored to be here. So you and I um, have had quite a bit of interaction uh, over the past, I would say, four or five years where we've had an opportunity to, to sit across the table from one another and have a, have a beer and talk in broad strokes uh, about your business. And, in uh, but, but, but I don't, I don't know you like, like at all. And it has been a whole lot of fun for me to, to do the research and, uh, and learn a, a little bit about your upbringing and learn a little bit about your university uh, experience and your athletic career and learn a little bit about the founding of, of, of the family business that you've been a part of uh, since 1984. But if you would, just tell us, before we dig into the backstory, tell us uh, what Brandshare is today. Yeah, um, Brandshare is an e-commerce media network. And what does that mean? It's a consortium of 750 e-commerce retailers that are collectively shipping out over 85 million FedEx e-commerce order packages of the merchandise that their customers just bought. And it's within these packages, in-home packages, that we embed a product sample or brand experience insert in with that e-com order on a surprise and delight a customer experience. So if my wife bought bed linens and bath towels from bedbathandbeyond.com, we're going to embed a Tide Pods downy sample, dual sample in there with a collateral piece to go buy it at your favorite retailer. So it's a washable and it's laundry detergent and fabric softener makes perfect right. sense. And we make those partnerships on an all day long, everyday basis for the benefit of our e-com retailers, as well as our brands. That's great. Talk a little bit about your upbringing. I know that you were part of uh, an entrepreneurial family, but talk about your early childhood and the kinds of things that interested you. I, I say this a lot. I'm not interested in what was your favorite color. I'm interested in, you know, what were some of the early experiences that helped you identify passions and strengths and interests and who are some of the, the mentors that, that you had as a, as a young man that uh, in, in, inspired you, uh, the people that you looked up to and, and maybe even guided you along a certain path, the people that really influenced you? Yeah, well, we, we grew up with nine kids in the family, mom and dad and, and grandma lived with us as well. We had a twin house up against railroad tracks. So it was four bedrooms and, you know, Graham took one and mom and dad the other. And there's two bedrooms with bunk beds everywhere for nine kids. Yeah. And we thought everyone lived like that because everyone on our, on our neighborhood basically did. Six kids, mm -hmm. 10 kids, whatever it was. Uh, so there you have to what? You have to you know, eat in self-defense, one, to get a meal. And two, if you want something extra, you got to go earn the money to, to buy it. Mm -hmm. Anything. I mean, from Converse All-Stars, mm -hmm, they're $10 when you're a kid. We got the Jeepers from Kmart. But if you wanted to, you know, the converse, you had to go cut lawns. So that's one of the things from an entrepreneur. I did 21 lawns and I could look, go back and look at each lawn and see how small they really are now. Back then they would look like a football field, but hey, it all worked out there. So mentors, uh, many of my mentors were coaches uh, from, from football in high school, even in grade school, and then, then in college. And, and some, of the, some of those mentors we uh, keep in touch with, whether it's a track and field coach in, co in high school or it's the football coaches, the Tom Coughlin's or Jack McNell's that were with us at Boston College during my playing days. Yeah. And how did you end up at Boston College? I mean, talk about your high school experience. Obviously, you, you were a standout athlete, but talk a little bit about that high school experience and, and the, the path from there to, to Boston College. Uh, when I got to high school, I was only going to play basketball. That was my sport, right? Hmm. Of course, um, that was not my sport. And my freshman year, the freshman coach who also um, taught PE, I didn't go out for football. And he said, I need a quarterback. Our quarterback, a freshman, got hurt. So he asked me to come out halfway through the season. I do. Hmm. You know, I, it works out as a quarterback. And I had uh, two nice years, <clears throat> junior and senior year, where I was recruited by a lot of different colleges from Notre, Notre Dame to North Carolina, the Penn State. But BC, Boston College, I just felt really comfortable with as a family unit. And uh, for the coaches and the most, mostly the players that I got introduced to in my visit up there, um, I, I, it was the best decision of my life. And BC made a huge difference in my life, not just on the field, but off the field, 
so many of the opportunities that have come to me as a direct result of playing football at Boston College. Yeah. You lettered three out of the four years, right? I mean, what were some of the highlights of your experience on the field at Boston College? Um, you know, getting be, being the underdog, playing Texas A&M as a quarterback and, and, went and beating them up at our place. Uh, and then the next year, in between that year, uh, I was a quarterback all my life. And during my junior year, we had this freshman quarterback come in who was amazing. He was, a, he was absolutely the best player in the field every time he played as a freshman. I, his, I've heard of him. <laughs> and his name is Doug, Doug Flutie. And Dougie right. took, took over the, the fourth game of our junior year and his freshman year. And I had to make a decision between my junior year and senior year during winter workouts and spring ball of, am I going to keep playing quarterback and sit on the bench knowing that we're going to be really good to our senior year? Or do I make a switch? Or do I transfer? So I made the decision to switch to defensive end outside linebacker my senior year. And that means going into spring ball, putting these big pads on and putting this crossbar on and this neck brace on that I never wore in my life. And I was only 210 pounds at that point. Hmm. So I made that decision and went on the other side of the ball, six string, going into my senior year of spring ball. At the end of spring ball, I had went up to first string. So here we go. We're senior year. We're opening up over the over the winter and summer. I had gained 30 pounds. And I have to say this, drug free, no steroids, because mm -hmm. that's the easy thing to do. Yeah. To, to gain 30 pounds. But I'm 20 years old and and I'm 210 and I came in at 240. And uh, I did everything I need to do to do that um, from a nutrition standpoint and a weightlifting standpoint. So we open up at Texas A&M and Texas A&M this year, this time. So it's at Texas A&M. Gary Kubiak and all the guys are there uh, for A&M. And again, they're 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 ranked 14th, and we're not ranked. And we're supposed to drudge us, and we come in and just pound them, 38 to 18, I believe the final score was. And it was an awesome experience to be in that locker room afterwards and hugging the guys and and the coaches that embraced me as a defensive player instead of an offensive player. And we just laughed and had a great time. And that flight home, getting in at five in the morning on campus was just an awesome, awesome situation. And we, yeah. we, we had a, a great senior year, went to the Tangerine Bowl, which is now the Capital One Bowl. And back then it was only 12 bowls. So you really had to be good. You were, you, yeah. you were eight, two and one, and you couldn't be you know seven and four to get to a bowl. You had to, you had to be good and we played Auburn uh, down to Tangerine Bowl and Bo Jackson's team, who yeah. uh, we played tough. We did lose by by six, but um, it was a great experience being being with them for a week and hanging out with the Auburn guys for a full week. Yeah. Did you aspire at that time to a, a career in the NFL, or did you were was college enough? No, I I uh, you know as, as a play one year in on defense, I certainly didn't have the the knowledge of guys that played all their life at that defensive end or outside linebacker position. But I was drafted by the USFL, the Boston Breakers, as an outside linebacker. Didn't sign with them because you miss your second semester of your senior year. It's a spring league. And, you know, I'm going to graduate. Um, but I would, during pro days, uh, different teams would come. Bengals and the, and, uh, the Patriots and the, and the Browns came and worked me out and take you out to dinner. And, and uh, I did not get drafted by the NFL, but I, immediately after the, the final round, there's three teams called me and I had to pick, I could pick the one that I thought I had the best shot of making the team as a linebacker. So I went with the Patriots, had a great camp, didn't make it. I was not good enough at that point in my life and uh, went from there. Then that's where I came home, tail between my legs, I get cut from the Patriots. I interviewed with a, with a, uh, with a uh, marketing company up in Boston on the cusp of, hey, if I don't get, if I don't get, uh, make the team, I have a backup. And the third one is I took a real estate uh, class during that summer after I graduated and took the exam right before I went to camp. Yeah. So I had three things going for me. When I got cut, I got the letter from the real estate company or real estate exam, you failed. Hmm. And then I called the medical sales company and they said, Doug, I thought you were gonna make it. We just gave the position away last wow. week. So I was over three in 24 hours. And uh, come home and this is what we do. That's that was that was good because you know blessings in the skies. Came yeah. home and uh, me and my dad started 
uh, brain share. Yeah. So let's let's hit pause and rewind, and let's talk about your 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 father's um, kind of entrepreneurial journey while you were at university. He he returned from uh, Korea and and you, you know worked in communications and and uh, you know went to work for a company, but then he ended up starting. Uh, one business and then another business. So talk a little bit about in as much detail as you want about your father and everything that was kind of going on uh, in, in his life, especially entrepreneurially, up to the point of, of you and he and your siblings working to start Brandshare. Yeah, uh, Dick, my dad uh, was a salesperson for Dun & Bradstreet and then went over to Direct Media. Direct Media was the largest mailing list broker in the world back in the day in the in the 70s and early 80s um, and even in the 90s but 83 is when he said you know what um, I'd like to start my own company and I said dad what do you do and and I then I figure out what he did and he goes if I do the list can you do the catalog part the catalog part is hey talking to catalogers and trying to get them to open up their packages to embed a brand insert or an American Express uh, application, et cetera, where it makes sense. So that was my job for to create incremental revenue for the for the catalogers back then, and then get the the inserts or the brands to to understand what the value proposition was for them, and do that while he ran the list division, I ran the insert media division, and that was part that was the company. And as we needed another salesperson, we asked one of our brothers or sisters, "Hey, are you happy where you are?" And we just kept adding the salespeople, which were my brothers and sisters. And uh, worked out real well. And Dick, Dick, uh, as we grew up, and as we, you know, got in our troubles as teenagers, and as we were starting these businesses and go try overcoming this, not trying, but overcoming these adversities that we all had, starting business businesses out of nothing from scratch. Uh, he, 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 he never, and I mean never, because it, it wasn't. It was appropriate that he never did, I, I think, because this is where he went through in Korea was, you know, a lot of life and death situations, yeah. business or football. Everyone says it's a battle. It's not a battle. It's a little bar fight every five seconds. It's a bar, five second bar fight in, in football. In, in business, you're not going to die if you don't get the deal. Yeah. And Korea, yeah, there were many, many, many times, especially the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir um, in North Korea, where there were 17 nights when the 20 degree below to zero and every night the Chinese and North Koreans would attack at 12 o'clock at night. And um, it was raging until three or four in the morning, every night. Yeah. Yeah. That was stuff that he didn't ever want to talk about. And we, yeah. didn't, we didn't pull it out of him until about eight or nine years ago. Yeah. And then we learned, and then you read books like Breaking Out and uh, The Last Day in a Fox Company. And these are, these are blow by blows um, background histories of the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir. And all, all anyone has to do that's listening is Google the Chosen, Chosen Reservoir Battle and they'll watch a two and a half minute video on it and then they can dig deeper if they want to. Yeah. But it's one of the two battles that when you join the Marines, they, sh they describe these two battles, Battle of the Bulge and the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir of how the Marines reacted and got their men either winning and or out of a situation where they were surrounded by 120,000 enemies and there's only 10,000 of them. Yeah. So um, really amazing. He can't talk about it without welling right up and, and crying. We went fishing this weekend, uh, just me and him in a boat for four hours. And you know, when he did bring it up, it was really tough for him to talk about. Yeah. But when he does talk about it, I, I, I want to know more because he's 90 now. I want to know more. And he finally did tell me about the, the North Korean, which is a Russian tank coming out of the, sh at the bunker, firing a howitzer, 88 mil, right at their, their team. And there's six guys that went up in the air. The only reason they're still here, other than the lure looking out after him and them, is there's, there's sand there and the shell went into the sand, blew the sand up and they got thrown out of the air and they're, they're, they're getting up and checking themselves and doing the body part. Do I still have my legs, my arms? And they do. And of course they're all concussed and no one knows what the concussion is back then. Um, but they returned fire and got to get out of there. 
that's just one of the many things that has happened to him um, that he, he's starting to share as a seven, as a 90 year old. Yeah. Well, in, in the, the toughness and the perspective that it would, you know, you know, it would give a person and the, the, the belief that if I can, if I can survive this, I mean, what, 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 what can't I, what can't I survive? Yeah. What, what I read about it was absolutely amazing. And I'll, I'll, I'll check out that, that video. Um, mm -hmm. so what were the, what were the early days like at, at branch here? I, I assume that you all were bootstrapping the business and, and as you know, new customers came on, as you mentioned, you were, you would, you know, invite more of your siblings to, to join, to, to keep up with things, but how, how long did it take to find, you know, rhythm and momentum where you, ah. where you find, where you recognize that this is, this is a real business. Yeah. That's a great question. Cause you know, the first year you're, of course it's bootstrap, bootstrapping. No, we went yeah. to banks. I remember going to banks and them saying, no, thank you to mm -hmm. us, our request of a $50,000 loan. And you know, this is 37 years ago. I get it, but it, it's, it seems like it was two years ago. Hmm. And I can still remember being in that, that banker's office in Philly and I'm saying, you know, when you, when you have a little track record, let us know and we'll be happy. You know, well, we need it now. So yeah. bootstrapping is a great word. Um, $75 a week was my salary, which I can't live on, but so I'm living at home after yeah. college. And that's the worst place you want to do. So it took, that fed me to get as many clients as possible immediately so in six months or eight months, which was actually nine months, you know, I could rent a guy, rent a place with um, you know, my high school buddies, which I did. So it took us though about four or five years to get the real traction where we were like, all right, let's go, let's let's hammer this home. We never yeah. weren't, weren't gonna make it successful. It was just it took us that long. Um, and and you know, even after eight years, I'm, you know, here comes a recession in, in 89 and 90. And we have to overcome that, and we did. And some, some, some of our other competitors didn't make it through that. And there is, you know, 37 years. There's three major recessions that we overcome, overcame. And it's, you know, that marine uh, mantra of improvise, overcome, and adapt. And that's what he always had. Never said it, but that's what he did. You know, led with his, his actions, not his words. So I think that really, yeah. really laid off on all of us, the the, the siblings. And my, my brother, older brother, Stevens, our CFO, my older sister, Kathy, is our COO um, to this day. And my, one of my younger brothers, Michael, who's a Naval Academy grad, uh, is our uh, VP of operations. So that's with 52, yeah, other, 52 other people uh, that are in New York and you know, Philadelphia and Bentonville and San Francisco. Uh, so we, we have a great team. We don't need to be 150 people. 52 to 60 is there, you know, where we're going to be. And as we grow, and uh, we have we have the the scalability with the team what we have net right now. Yeah. During those first five years, when you were trying to, um, you know, find find real momentum, were you and your father focused exclusively on brand share, or were one or or both of you working on you know other other things in order to pay the bills while you know keeping as much cash as you could in brand share to you know allow it a better shot at surviving. Yeah, it was all in. It was like, hey, I, I wasn't even bartending at, bartending at night um, because, you know, Saturday nights and Saturday mornings and, and Sunday evenings, it was all in. It was, it was everything it is, what, what we would need to do to make this a success. And we, and we did. But there were many, 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 many times, Matt, that, you know, you, you go, is there an end to this? bootstrapping, we're on our 12th year, we're on our eighth year, whatever it is. And, you know, I, I look at what we have in the bank and it's not there. It's not like the startups of today get B PE or, you know, private equity or VC money or, or angel friends and family. And there's a couple million dollars there. There was zero. So yeah. we, we were always looking at month to month, quarter to quarter, year to year. And when is this going to, you know, get over that hump and actually have a shareholder distribution, let's say, of, of all the shareholders, which were all the family members. And that took a long time to get to that point. And it was a really nice situation. But a real breakthrough, Matt, was, you know, eight years into it, 1991, because we were not all about going after the CPGs. We were out going after the direct response insert, in, in direct response advertisers. Um, the CPG was a fluke meeting in San Francisco at the, one of the world's largest um, uh, marketing conferences at the time, Direct Marketing Association, where 
there's 20,000 uh, attendees there. And it was in a different, it was the biggest event in marketing. It was called direct marketing, but yes, but there was plenty of brands that would go there too. Cause there was, they were doing, there was no digital back then. So, you know, they would plow into uh, the world of direct response marketing. Awesome. Whether it was TV, in the mail, whatever it may be, anything with the 800 number or a call to action was direct response. So there's 1500 booths in Moscone Center and we can only afford a 10 by 10, of course. And we can only afford to spend one, send one guy there or gal there and, and, I'm, and I'm it. And it's a three day conference, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And Thursday is the last day and it closes at seven o'clock. They make an announcement at six o'clock. Please don't, please don't pull down your booth until seven o'clock to all the exhibitors like us. Cause everyone's trying to get out of Dodge and yeah. get a little bit of families. I get it. But I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting here till seven o'clock. I'm not pulling this thing down. I'm going to get every last prospect out and talk to him yeah. and educate him or her. So too much at stake. Right. And you know, we're at a point where we got to do that. It, it was the, it was the start startup mentality and founder mentality that, you know, you, you had to have, or yeah, there's no plan B. Yeah, there is no plan B. Exactly. So 10 of seven, 10 of seven, I'm still arms folded. Someone's got to come. And I tell you, everyone around me is pulling down and walking out. One guy, I see him then down at the end of the, end of the aisle, just looking around and he's, suit, he's got a full suit on. He's an older gentleman, older. I was a you know, young guy, young kid. And he looks at me and he, when he comes up to my booth and he goes, what do you guys do? And I tell him and I said, who are you with? And he goes, Johnson Johnson McNeil. I said, what brand do you work on? I work on all the brands, but I'm really looking for an alternative to a sampling uh, vehicle that we've been using too long uh, for Tylenol. I said, great. Who are you looking? What target audience are you looking for the weekend warrior? All right. I got the L beans and I got the Eddie Bowers and I got the sportsman's guide and I got the Cabela's, all the guys and gals that go hunting, fishing, rock climbing, camping, uh, running, whatever it is. And they got to go to work Monday. So that's perfect. Let's get a sample and a collateral piece in the, in the four, those four 50,000 units each, 50,000 samples each, 200,000 total, not a big deal, but it's important because it's the first CBG. Yeah. And when, when he looked at the results from his, just the UPC uh, coupon code, he's like, something's gotta be wrong. It, the, the response is so high. Hmm. And I said, I, I'll check on my end, but see if there was a duplicate UPC code somewhere, but no, we had four separate codes. And he checked on his end and it was like, nope, this is, this is what's happening. So we went from 200,000 to 4 million pieces in about four months later. And that's when that flick went off in my mind going, hey, this whole world of CPG brands never don't know about the world of what we're doing. And we call it kind of brand direct marketing. And I say kind of because direct marketing was, was still, is still a thing then. Brand marketing is a thing, but it was really brand direct marketing because we were direct in home targeted to that individual uh, customer who's buying and, and it's being delivered by FedEx or UPS in the comfort and privacy and safety of their home. So mm -hmm. nowhere does that resonate more than now with COVID, I get it. But this is 1991, this is almost 30 years ago um, when that revelation came where, hey, there's a big world out there that we didn't know about, Brandshare didn't know about, IDR, IDR Brandshare didn't know about and that we just went all in and said, let's go. And, and we did, and that made all the difference. So I'm guessing that was a big turning point in the business. You've got this, you know, huge, huge brand to create, you know, a nice halo effect for your, for your business, just the association with, with J and J you've got this great case study that you can then walk into other CPG brands and say, this is what we've done and what we can do for you. How did your business change from that point forward in terms of, you know, were there a lot of other CPG brands that, that, that came on quickly as a result of your success with J and J? Yes. And, and I didn't know how big the CPG world was. And it was me just trying to figure it out. So I would go to those conferences. Back then it was the Promo Expo. Path to Purchase didn't exist. Path to Purchase Institute didn't exist. Companies like yours didn't exist. So I would go there and talk to the Prinas and the P&Gs and they're like, what do you mean? You can do this? You can 
put my sample into these packages that are going in home to my target audience. And, I, and we just created lifestyle networks, whether it was appearance conscious women, all the fashion catalogers slash as it morphed into e-com retailers, retailers, moms with kids, you know, outdoor enthusiasts, gardeners, diabetics, you know, whatever the target audience that brand wanted, we created and we, now we have 42 different lifestyle networks. With, with all of them that are very scalable, testable too, and in, in, you know, a couple hundred thousand, but scalable to the tens of millions on a monthly basis. Yeah. So did business from a financial standpoint, from a headcount perspective, did it, did it take off like a rocket from, from that point forward? And what were some of the, some of the pains associated with that rapid growth? I'd say some of the pains, it wasn't immediate. It wasn't you know, six months and we were, we were, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. It was, it was still a, a family business. It was mm-hmm. still me and my brothers and my, and my dad uh, trying to, you know, do this all on our own. We didn't know, we didn't un- know or understand or, or and you didn't have the, you didn't have the internet or social media to help tell your story either. Exactly. It was just, it was just you. It, 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 that's exactly it. And there's no PE money or, or VC money, you know, feeding us saying, Hey, Here's here's a half million dollars to you know do some marketing for yourself. The, the cobbler has no shoes. We're out there one on one calling, calling and going to the um, going to the conferences, uh, but that's not super scalable. Um, yeah, we can put an ad in ad, ad age like we did and and you know get some brand awareness for our programs, our program. But uh, that was took four, five, six years to get where we wanted to be, and in between there. What, what happens? Competitors look at what we're doing and go, huh, that's a great idea. I'm going to start a competing network. So we probably had over the years, 10 different companies start try to start a competing network. All, all did not work out for them. And the, the, the main reason there without, you know, I'm trying to be humble about it, but we have great relationships with our e-com retailers and our catalogers that morphed into e-com retailers. I mean, we totally take care of them. Why wouldn't we? Of course we would, no matter what where you know, many of the other companies that tried it, tried to do it you know, and turned to fast dollar in six, 12 months and it you know, didn't work out. So 18 months, they're, they're gone onto, onto something else that they see as the shiny lure going by. So we were dedicated to them, e-com retailers. This, they're not vendors, they're our clients. Our e-com retailers are clients as much as the brands are. So it's not a vendor brand relationship, it's a client client relationship we have to make sure it works for both parties. And if it doesn't, we have a problem. So we bet out the brand to make sure it's a perfect match for the e-com retailer as much as the e-com retailer, it's a perfect match for the brand. And then who wins? The customer wins because he or she is getting a great product sample in the comfort and privacy and safety of her home. And then if she likes it, she can one click buy it with the collateral QR code that has developed over the years, over the last few years from our, our digital component. So fast forward, when was there another major iteration on your business as a result of, uh, you know, e- e- e-commerce and, and how has your business changed, let's say over the past, over the past 10 years? Yeah, the major iteration was really change, changing our, you know, believe it or not, we, our name of our, of our program was the catalog package sampling program. Mm-hmm. Because why? Because it was catalogs right. in the 90s. So we changed that uh, 12 years ago to brand share because it's, you know, the catalog is a misnomer now. It's, it's, you know, Cabela's used to send out 140 million catalogs before 1995. And then it went to 100, then it went to 80, then it went to 70 for all the right reasons. And, you know, now they're sending out 5 million to guys like me who like to hunt and fish um, or love to hunt and fish. I shouldn't say like, because, you know, they're going to send catalogs just to their best customers. Victoria's Secret, the same thing on, on the, the woman's side, but they're not sending hundreds of millions like they used to. Why? Because everyone knows now they can go to the site and see the latest and greatest um, and buy immediately with one click shipping, one click uh, ordering and shipping. What is, um, what, what did, in, in what way did, did COVID most significantly impact your, your business, positively or negatively? Well, you know, COVID accelerated a lot of the buying behaviors uh, that are around e-commerce as well as online grocery. 
you know, people didn't want to go to the malls or the retail stores or the grocery stores. So they found out, hmm, let me test this out, this online grocery thing, and saw it was super easy to do. And it's already been figured out by the Walmarts and, and Kroger's and Food Lions and, and the Aholds of the world, the stop and shops. So they have a system down and it works tremendously, whether it's delivering at home or order today and pick it up tomorrow at two o'clock in a certain parking parking space where you don't have to get out of the car, pop the trunk, the store associate comes out and boom, puts it in your in your trunk, you drive away. You don't talk to anybody, you don't touch anybody, you don't touch anything. So that COVID has simply accelerated that where the OG online grocery was going to hit a certain point by 26, 27, 2026. It's already there now. Those, those sales are there now. E-commerce was growing 15, 16% a year. Traditional retail is growing two or 3% a year. And, and now e com is growing 32% a year. So that bump was COVID related. And that those buying behaviors for e com and online grocery, will they go down a little bit and adjust? Yeah, because people still like to go to the mall in store still going to always be a thing but but there's trillions of dollars now at stake in e-com that's why brands need to be aware of what's going on in e-commerce and online grocery there's so much going on in e-com e-commerce media retail media as, as uh, some folks call it as well as online grocery there's so many opportunities so as that grows the media opportunities grow and we're right on the front of that so yes, we use our econ media network as our core, but there's there's so many spokes to that that we're developing and bringing to market for the better fit, betterment of the brands that are participating. Do do you have a sweet spot as a company? Doug, do you have a, does your company have a sweet spot in terms of the categories of of um, CPG brands that you can support or the sizes of those organizations? You know, we don't have a sweet spot because whether you're a DTC or an innovative brand or a challenger brand, and you have a bit of PE or VC money that you need to grow that brand. So you can become an Annie's and General Mills can buy you for $800 million. If that's your goal, we can work with you when you're just a, a, you know, a young challenger brand. Or if you're a legacy brand like Tylenol and you have to defend your market share that you spent billions of dollars building, yeah. but here come all the challenger and innovative brands after you. And you need to present your legacy brand to the next generation of users. And like, like my kids, they're, they're the next, they're, they're just graduated college. They're getting into the workforce. You know, what are they going to use for their headaches or what are they going to use for their shoulder pain? What are they, what kind of uh, products are they going to uh, put in their body from snacks or, um, you know, uh, an energy bar or an energy drink or whatever it may be. So, Hey, the things they did as teenagers are going to be different at 20 and then 30. So I, I say from a sweet spot standpoint, um, personal care, beauty care, uh, snack, uh, certainly not frozen food, but food products that are sampleable are right in our, in our collective scalable sweet spot. Uh, but again, it could be Disney, you know, Disney can, they can't sample a cruise, but they can certainly direct you to their site and show you a video of how great it is by, by utilizing a, an awesome uh, brand booklet. And then put a luggage tag in there as a premium so Sheila and Joey can roll, roll around for the next two years with a luggage tag. Lunchables, yeah. they can't sample Lunchables because it's not shelf stable, but they could put a growth chart in there that are Lunchables and it would hang on my son's wall when it, yeah. from the point that he's six years old to 12 years old. So brand awareness as well doesn't have to be a sampleable product. Yeah. Such an exciting time to be working in, let's just say retail, you know, broadly working with consumer brands, working with, you know, companies that are solving problems that didn't even, you know, exist five, six, seven right. years, years ago. If someone wanted to learn more about, about brand share and, and, and maybe even dip a toe in the water, experiment, what would be the best way to, uh, to, to contact someone on your team? Uh, I would love to, you know, 24 seven, this is, I always say this is, this business has become a so fun for me. It's almost like a hobby. So it's not like, Hey, it's Saturday morning. I got to work. No, I love to work. And it's not even work. It's educating a new brand about, you know, what they can do in e-commerce and online grocery. 
they can contact me, dgeyer at brandshare.us. And certainly good. hit our site, brandshare.us. It's not .com, yeah. .us. Yeah, very good. Doug, I, I cannot tell you how, how, uh, how sorry I am for the technical glitches that we, that we had. And, and I hope that Alex can uh, clean it all up in post-production. But thank you so much for making time to visit. Your story is, uh, is fascinating. It's been fun even before the conversation started to learn more about you and, and about your family. Uh, congratulations on, on your success, especially after you know, uh, struggling through the beginning like any, like any founding family would and just uh, having the perseverance and, and the vision and, and uh, the ability to, to change on the fly and, and uh, even the, the tiniest decisions that it seems like we're making in a moment in time, staying there to the very end of that trade show. It was a complete game changer for the, for the whole organization and, and uh, just so exciting to see the way is that, uh, ways that your business has been blessed and your family's been blessed and uh, wish you all the, the very best going forward. Thank you again for your time and I hope you have a great day.